Well, good morning to everybody. Let me uh, say how happy I am to be here. Uh, you know, when you get to the point in life where I am, uh, you say, I'm just happy to be. Uh, but I'm really delighted to be here. I want to thank uh, all of you, Mike and, and Bill, for all of the work that you did to help me stay here. Uh, you were very, very, very supportive, and I can't say thank you enough because without it, I don't know what the outcome of the election would have been. Uh, but we have been able to work together uh, uh, over the years uh, for mutual concerns. Half of my congressional district is rural, and your focus is on rural America. And so we have uh, mutual interests and concerns, uh, your stakeholders, uh, my constituents, and I want you to know just how much I appreciate you. Um, thank you, Mike, for the introduction. And uh, it's really an honor for me to be able to address the National Rural Lenders Roundtable once again uh, as we reaffirm uh, our commitment, your commitment, to improving the quality of life in America's rural communities. I'm proud of the partnerships uh, forged between the Roundtable, uh, rural communities, uh, USDA rural development, uh, as together we leverage federal policies uh, that Congress has passed uh, to create new opportunities in rural infrastructure, affordable housing, uh, and economic development. You know, at the end of this month, as uh, Mike told you, I will have completed my 15th term in the House of Representatives uh, and my fourth year as chairman of the Subcommittee of Agriculture, uh, Rural Development, uh, FDA, and related agencies. Um, th this has uh, been a real labor of love for me because I have a real passion uh, for rural America. Uh, throughout my tenure, I've had a wonderful working relationship with uh, USDA Rural Development, uh, both in D.C. and back home in Georgia. And so I look forward in the next Congress to continuing and to growing uh, our productive relationship during the 118th Congress. Uh, I may not be setting the agenda, but I will be the number two person at the table for the subcommittee. And I will be, Mike, in a position uh, to try to be helpful. I'd like to take a moment to uh, commend the relationship that we have been able to develop with my friend, uh, the Undersecretary for Rural Development, Socio Torres Small. I think the last time I addressed you, she was here, and I think she spoke just before I did. Uh, but they've worked really, really diligently uh, to serve our rural and our tribal communities all over the country. And um, she's, she's very passionate about it. Uh, and I'm happy uh, and pleased that she's been to the 2nd District of Georgia twice. And we're looking forward to her coming back. Because every time she comes, uh, she brings good news uh, of uh, uh, things to come uh, in green. Uh, that is money. So the investments that they are putting uh, into rural America and in South Georgia uh, are very, very welcome, very much needed, and she is a great, great partner. Now, we've highlighted the crucial investments in rural broadband uh, and efforts to rebuild rural hospitals, uh, to improve rural health care. Uh, this makes possible, uh, this is made possible not only by support from our federal government, but through the partnerships uh, and relationships uh, that we build and that you build with leaders in our local communities. Rural development, I think, uh, is in great hands uh, in this administration. And I look forward to continuing our close working relationship, uh, welcoming the Undersecretary back to Middle and Southwest Georgia, uh, and of course, uh, we want to be highlighting future successes. Uh, being from and representing a rural district, I've long been a supporter of the USDA programs as well as the many roles uh, that staff and the stakeholders play in making them successful and effective. Over the past four years, I've been blessed <clears throat> as chairman of the 
our ag, rural development, uh, uh, food and drug administration and pro subcommittee, I've been, I've had the good fortune to work with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Uh, they were ranking, I was chairman, and over the years we've reversed roles, but we have a good working relationship, and I expect that <clears throat> we will be able to continue uh, that good relationship. Please know that as I continue on the subcommittee, I will continue to work hard for your stakeholders, the stakeholders that USD has so that we can provide and hope that you will help us to provide the needed uh, input, insight, and feedback as we develop the policy uh, for looking after rural America, particularly the capital needs because that's your area of interest. At the end of the month, of course, uh, I am looking forward to the end of, of this year. Uh, we've had a lot to happen. I think a lot of good things have happened. And uh, in that regard, if you look at what was accomplished in just the last two years, uh, two years ago, uh, the economy was shut down. Schools were closed, uh, people were dying, and of course we have been able to turn the corner on that. Uh, the economy has been jump-started. Uh, it's almost too hot uh, with inflation as it is, but we're working to try to get that under control. But we are a lot better off today than we were two years ago. Um, as you know, rural development operates a broad range of Loan programs providing financing from the one RD guaranteed loan initiative and the Ash Property Lending Program to the new food supply chain and the meat processing lending opportunities. So there are increasing opportunities for you uh, to do what you do so well, and that is support uh, economic development in rural America. Uh, individually, uh, these investments address unique challenges. Collectively, uh, they provide the opportunity for rural America, and we must work hard to ensure not only that these communities are aware of the USDA development programs, uh, but that they have the technical support uh, to be able to apply for them. So many communities, particularly rural communities across the country, uh, need the programs, but they don't know about the programs, and when, if they do find out about them, they don't have the technical expertise and they don't have the resources to be able to, uh, to buy that, or to, to hire those technical as, um, uh, experts uh, to prepare those grant applications for them. So we are encouraging and working with uh, the department to make sure that they have regional people in place uh, to provide that assistance, to guide uh, the stakeholders, our constituents, uh, uh, your stakeholders, uh, through the process uh, so that they know what programs are available and they will be providing uh, through many of the programs, the 2501 program, for example, uh, help, technical assistance to help them apply for uh, those, those uh, opportunities. And of course, um, all of those programs behind them, the USDA programs, that's USDA-backed financing. And uh, an individual who comes to you may not realize it, uh, but by working together with uh, USDA and the rural leaders, you are really creating uh, more affordable capital uh, to support the businesses and the community development needs in rural America. And many times, the folks, your customers don't even know uh, what is involved. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, rural and tribal communities uh, faced persistent uh, economic challenges uh, that inhibit their ability to thrive and to reach parity uh, with more heavily populated areas in the urban and suburban communities. Uh, as a consequence, now more than ever, uh, as we come out of the pandemic and our country's economy roars back, uh, we have to make sure that rural America shares in the success. And that's what you do. Uh, reviving and rebuilding rural America are fundamental to this effort. 
and the resources that you provide are crucial are to making it happen. You've been doing a tremendous job of keeping the resources flowing. And I just have to say thank you. I, I, I get my ear bent very often by Mike Thomas <laughs> calling to make sure that the resources don't run out. Uh, that uh, when you get down to what has been allocated, and need some more, he's there asking for it. And so I recognize uh, that you provide a, an essential service, uh, but you can't do it without the available resources that Congress makes possible, particularly through the guaranteed loans. So please know that I know that you are lifeline and I want to be helpful to you. Uh, as chairman, I recognize the changing demands uh, and it may require uh, increased funds for you, and I'll be doing my best through the appropriations process. But right now, uh, we haven't finished the FY23 appropriations bill. Uh, currently, we're operating under a continuing resolution, as you know, uh, which expires December the 16th. And it's going to be very difficult to complete the negotiations uh, by December 16th uh, for an omnibus. And uh, right now, uh, we don't know uh, when that will be, uh, but we are really, really trying to twist arms and to bend ears. Uh, we have not had the constructive conversations over the past uh, few weeks that we need to have to get it done. Uh, but I'm an optimist, and my 30 years of experience uh, has taught me that uh, while we may not see light right now, but we'll get it done, and it will probably get done uh, before Christmas. <laughs> Not that <laughs> <laughs> um, let, me, let me just say that uh, also, with regard to uh, what we're going through with the negotiations, um, we need to get it done because we need to start on FY24 and we need to get the farm bill done. Uh, we could be looking, if you listen to the other side, uh, at tighter budgets next year uh, and I think we should be prepared uh, for that because we're going to have to fight for every dollar that we, we get. Uh, it was easy for Mike and Bill to come to me and say, we need a little bit more. We talk to the secretary, and we write the secretary, call the secretary, and he finds a way to do it. Uh, however, uh, once the gavel changes on that subcommittee, uh, my leverage will not be quite as great, uh, but still, I do have the ear of the secretary, uh, and I will be continuing uh, to fight for you. I'm sure that uh, you're aware that the mark as Mike indicated, for FY23 was $2 billion uh, for BNI, and uh, which is a 60% increase over FY22. A 60% increase <laughs> over FY22. Uh, and I recognize fully the growing demand uh, for the program, and I am optimistic about being able to uh, retain the funding level that we got uh, in the final bill. We need three billion. All right. <laughs> He's your advocate, no question about it. Uh, but we are continuing to make uh, critical investments in our rural infrastructure, water, wastewater systems, broadband. And I'd like to explore some additional opportunities to help our rural health care systems that continue to struggle. In Georgia and all across uh, rural America, we're losing hospitals. Uh, they just are having a, a tremendous difficulty, and those are areas that need health care the most. And so we're going to be asking you to be as creative as you can be uh, to help these communities uh, get the health care facilities uh, that they need in order to keep uh, Americans healthy. Uh, we are, as I said, working on the Farm Bill uh, for next year, and of course it will be the, uh, the Farm Bill for 2023. 
Uh, we are hoping to improve, uh, to tweak uh, the programs that are in the uh, current bill. Uh, most of the, uh, the stakeholders, uh, the commodity groups, uh, are pleased with the structure of it, but they want tweaks. Uh, obviously, uh, more money and um, regulatory regimes that is more friendly uh, to, uh, to them and what they do. And of course, uh, I subscribe to the belief that uh, regulations should be based in sound science. They should be subjected to a cost-benefit analysis, and they should make common sense. Those are my three criteria. And of course, uh, it's my hope that uh, as we go through the Farm Bill to make sure that we have a safety net uh, for our farm farmers uh, and our communities, uh, that we do so uh, in a way uh, that is workable and not overly uh, regulated. Uh, we've had over 60 hearings, and I participated in at least 30 of those uh, on the Farm Bill. And that was designed to get input. And believe me, we've gotten a lot of input. And that input tells us that the programs are working well, but they need to be uh, tweaked for the current exigencies. And of course, uh, prices are high for our farm com commodities. And what uh, the farmers are telling us is that uh, the safety net programs are designed for when prices are down. At the same time, because of a lot of world circumstances and the pandemic, the supply chain has been interrupted and the input costs have gone up. So the safety net programs that were designed to help when the prices go down are not really helping the bottom line when fertilizer and other input costs increase. And so we've got to look at that and be able to factor into the safety net uh, equation how we provide margin protection uh, for those producers uh, when their input increases. And so that will be something that uh, we will be working on in this farm bill. Uh, we have had several themes uh, to emerge, and of course I just told you about that safety net. But uh, the bottom line is that all of us who have an interest and a passion and the success of rural America will have to work together, we have to talk, uh, and this is on a bipartisan, nonpartisan uh, basis. Uh, we've got to do what is good for the people in America. I believe that when we come to Washington after elections are over, it shouldn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat because the policies that impact the American people are not Democrat nor Republican, or Republican policies, they are American policies. They are policies that help and touch each and every American every single day. And the, the um, work of the Department of Agriculture with all of its various programs uh, touches every single person in this country, wherever they live, every single day of the year. It's important. We've got to look after it. You have a role in it. I have a role as a lawmaker, uh, but together we have to get it done. And I think I always close with my favorite poem, The Bag of Tools. Isn't it strange how princes and kings and clowns and caper and sawdust rings and common folks like you and me are builders for eternity. Each is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass, and a set of rules. And each must make your life as flown a stumbling block or a stepping stone. I just want to thank you, wool lenders, all of you, for what you do every day, because you indeed are not stumbling blocks, but you are stepping stones to a more vital and successful and thriving existence for the people that live in rural America. So thank you for what you do. I thank you for your partnership, and I look forward to continuing to work with you over the next two years.